Hi everybody, welcome to Pi Podcasts, Hidden Figures of Python Podcast Series. The Pi Podcast is um, created to highlight voices from the underrepresented group members of the Python community. We follow the Python Software Foundation's Code of Conduct. So if you want to know a little bit more about the Code of Conduct, you can check on pipodcast.live slash conduct. That's P-Y-P-O-D-C-A-T-S dot live slash conduct. Conduct. Let me do a little bit um, of a self-introduction. My name is Georgie and I'm based in Amsterdam. I'm one of the Pi Podcasts host and I'm also one of the board director from the PSF. Over to you, Teresa. Hi, my name is Teresa. I'm based in Hamburg. I'm also one of the Pi Podcasts. I'm um, involved in several initiatives of um, Python Software Foundation, like the Code of Conduct work group, Diversity and Inclusion work group in Pi Ladies Hamburg. And on to you, Vicky, our guest for this episode. Hi, everyone. Vicky here. I'm based in Dublin, Ireland. I look after Pi Ladies Dublin here, and I have many, many hats on, um, which I won't name, but I am helping out in the PSF uh, Grants Working Group as well, uh, amongst other things. So thank you for having me here today. And thank you, Vicky, for joining. Well, Vicky, you have been an active uh, member in the Python community for quite some time. So how do you get started using the Python language? That was back in around 2002 uh, <laughs> when my now husband, um, then we used to work together um, in the company. He came across Python and we decided to use it to help streamline, streamline our internal tools processes, made our life really easy as, you know, devs are kind of lazy and stuff. So this really helped us out a lot. And it was, help, you know, it was just really nice and simple to use. And it was actually days before we encountered Python. I was actually, I did a Perl course at work. And I had to start, I was just sitting there lying on the table, forgotten once I discovered Python. So that's how, how I um, started using Python um, quite early on. And it was just, um, really helped us out, really improved things. I was, um, helped with a lot of projects and the, especially with the patch management and things like that, which it's great to see that even current day, I, I see my old colleagues still using, you know, Python and things like that. I, I assume they've improved on the tools, but it was good to be super early and just making life easy for everyone using a super amazing technology and, you know, super easy to use. That's really cool. I have a question though, regarding your involvement in the Python community. What attracted you to the community itself, like organizing events and getting into PyLadies, for example, like you're not just coding in Python, but you're doing so much more. What brought I suppose you uh, back in those days before Meetup and Eventbrite came around, uh, you have to know in Ireland, we may have one Meetup a year and that's through the Irish Linux user group mailing list, if you are honest and primarily word of mouth. I, much as I love my work colleagues at the time, I, I do want to learn from other people People, like my peers from other companies as well and other technology, which I just want my brain to be melted a little bit and don't understand. Uh, so when Python came about, um, probably two years after we discovered Python and we saw other people who were doing Python stuff and in Dublin, I saw the meetup, jumped on it. That was about 2004. It was started by an engineer called Darius Sharon and then it got rebooted in 2005 by the amazing Sean O'Donnell. And we were gathered around a dark pub, Irish pub. Yes, we're in Ireland, stereotype. We all meet in the pub. Yes, that's what we do. Sit around this tiny laptop in the dark pub, just not working. And someone said, let's get a room with a projector and give talks. And no one volunteered. So I said, oh, how hard could it be? So I took the ball and ran with it and uh, ran the Python Ireland meetups every month, nearly every month for nearly over 11 years before I handed it over. So that's how I got involved with the Python Ireland commu community. It was pretty much very early on. And when everything was extremely exciting, completely new technology, that was the hardest thing right then. And everyone just wanted to share what they did with Python and its related technologies. With PyLadies, um, that's another another story as well um, that got launched, um, you know, during PyCon Ireland, you know, in 2013 as well. So, yeah, a, a lot of things kind of started by me, I think, <laughs> a serial starter of things. <laughs> so so when was that? Is, is that in like a year 
It was um so uh, Pie Ladies Dublin uh, was launched in 2013. So that was uh, my last year chairing PyCon Ireland 2013. Um, it was it was a pivotal moment because you know, I managed to invite a very first um, female keynote technical speaker, and that was Lynn Root, and she was co-founder of the San Francisco chapter of Pie Ladies. And I go, it's a sign. Why not launch Pie Ladies Dublin? I was uh, launching not for profit initiatives all over the place around 2012 and 13. I said, what's one more to add to the list? Uh, so we launched it in 2013 during Sprint's weekend and we had about uh, six-ish people, a nice yummy cake and a plan that we don't want to be the same as other technical user groups at the time, which we know is right. uh, mainly two long talks with beer and pizza in the middle and then the pub afterwards. And and I did say we go to pub meetups a lot here, especially in Ireland, but the folks here did not want to go to uh, pubs, did not want pizza and beer all the time. They wanted something more interactive, but they do want something much and uh, I've been, I'm still doing it right now. And it's cu- currently trying to keep it small to try and make sure that it's not too scary for someone who's new coming to into the group and who wants to speak up or want to give a talk or just want to go around and meet other people right. and just don't feel like they want to run away. And because I'm not a coder mm. or I'm not this, I'm not a Python person. So don't make sure you just come along, you're curious or you just want to share and be excited about something you found in Python. Just share with us. It's, safe. it's a safe space. That's right. uh, so. So that's that's yeah, so 2013, quite quite a while ago. I'd like to add a question, a follow up question. Maybe it's a bit off script. Okay, so <laughs> um, how has the your involvement in the Python community helped in your career, or has it? helped in your career helping oh yes the, it, I'm so blessed to have come across the Python community especially as I said I was really very privileged in the right place at the right time being able to see Python in the early days being able to see a lot of the core developers especially when I've gone to Europe Python I actually came across them I didn't even know they were the core developers and then I kind of nearly fainted when my husband told me you were sitting on the table with all the core developers <laughs> uh, but they were so welcoming and so inviting and so amazing to talk to and so supportive Those those early days in 2009, while well, we're trying to prepare our first conference in 2010 for PyCon Ireland, it was the support of John Penner and everyone um, that helped us through, you know, setting up, like thinking of the ethos and why you're setting up the conference, who you're setting it up for. Um, I think meeting those people and being supportive um, gave me the kind of positivity that I want to pay for and help others as well. And that's why I carry that as I left Python Ireland behind and PyCon Ireland behind because um, other people have to take over. I was burning out, but I still want to carry on Pie Ladies Dublin. And I just love how just even global Pie Ladies, how we still have that ethos of, ethos of trying to help each other, trying to be inclusive and have safe spaces and stuff. Um, and that you know goes the same with Europe Python as well. And that, that is a huge scale. But I end up joining a lot of those just to figure out how things work and run in the background to try and improve how I do things here in Ireland and also share that experience with other tech community organizers. So yeah, I have, from a community side of things, I have learned a lot as a volunteer, running events, hosting events, organizing events. Um, career wise, I kind of stepped back a lot from being a developer as I got more pulled into the community side, even though it's all mostly volunteer. But I ended up working with, um, say, uh, like Dog Patch Labs, uh, co sharing. Uh, space who also runs a startup program uh, here uh, currently but they have a space for events and they were launching it at the time and they asked me to come in and connect them to the technical user groups around Dublin to tell them to come along and use it so I was pretty much like a liaison with the Irish tech scene and I was trying to keep a finger on the pulse there is a very active um, kind of tech community here. So Python, I think, formed the basis from that, where I started to meet a lot of different people because the meetup scene was so small and everyone started branching off and created their own niche groups, of not, not technically Python related, so to games, to, you know, different language user groups. Um, from that, I kind of bounced from different very kind of uh, interesting roles, like a game and curator researcher for uh, Dublin Science Gallery back in 2012, around that same period. That was, uh, I got paid to play games, research about games, go to games festivals and things like that. And they came, I interviewed a lot of game exhibitors or potential exhibitors who became exhibitors. And the gallery produced an amazing wonder world of an exhibition from my black and white spreadsheet. It was fantastic. Kind of, uh, that was completely fit so far away from coding, but related to games, related to tech, connected me to a lot of indies. And that's where I got involved with a lot of indies. So I kind of very 
spread out in a lot of geeky things. So community meant a lot to me. So ev- even though I start moving away from Python stuff, I always think back to how I got started. And that is Python, the community itself, the warm heartedness and the open arms of the community that brought me in in those early days and showed me the ropes. And I want to push, put, give that to everyone else because it is hard to start off for a lot of people. It is hard if you fall down, especially COVID and you need to restart again, you need that boost. And I want to help everyone as right. much as I can. Right. I think you're not the first invited um, guest that said how important the community has actually led us into um, the group and how it actually motivates us into like creating more events, creating more um, opportunities for everyone to join. Your story about um, pile, how you start Pi Ladies in uh, Dublin actually reminds me of how I started because uh, I was um, already in um, PyCon Thailand and organizing the event and one of the speakers was um, Lena from uh, Pi Ladies Japan, Tokyo. And she gave a talk about Pi Ladies. And I was like, hey, wait a minute, there isn't one in, in Bangkok. And that was how I actually started uh, Pi Ladies uh, Bangkok along with another um, co-founder. So I think a lot of us just kind of like a kind of chain effect that we actually link from one to another. And and I also like the, the way you mentioned about how um, you started PyCon Ireland. It was a it was a core group of us in the beginning. Uh-huh. Uh, there's only like six to maybe max twelve back before PyCon Ireland. Like you have to know that our largest ever meet meetup was like twenty people. You know this is <laughs> this is really small, but it was um, enthusiastic twenty people. But then when we had our first PyCon Ireland, it was nearly a hundred, and we go where were the wow. rest of you when we're asking for people to come and talk? That was down to boiling down to us wanting to get more experience. Be- because it was, uh, I pointed to uh, PyCon UK and John Penner was because they were, it was them who were actually calling out for the next host for EuroPython in 20, for 2010. And the core bunch of us would just so happen to be in EuroPython in Birmingham the year before when they were doing a call for a city to host. And that's how it started really. The ball got started there. And then of course a pub got in there as well. And when we're back in Ireland and I was the only sober one, but that was another side story. But uh, we, uh, we started PyCon Ireland and uh, yes, yeah, a bunch of us. And of course, when you, you need someone to open the conference and being a bunch of techies, no one wants to stand in front of everyone. So I got I said, hey, you, Vicky, you're doing a bunch of work. You know what's going on. You go and tell everyone what's happening. So people say it's down to practice when how, why, how do you speak in front of people? But, but it's more like it's still quite nerve, nerve wracking, but you have to do it. It's like a, it's like a job. You just get pushed out in front or else the conference will never start. <laughs> so uh, we just went ahead and did it. And so it wasn't just me. It was a team effort. It was such a big job. Okay, fair enough. Myself and my husband did spend the first pie planning the first PyCon, mostly in Hong Kong and Starbucks, trying to figure out sponsorship and figuring out swag and programs and the website. We did most of those stuff, but it's still a team effort because we need that support from the community in order to make it happen. And we had to start mm. from scratch, everything from scratch. And it's really hard. So uh, I completely, you know, understand if someone wants starting anything from scratch. Uh, with nothing to back, nothing, no sponsor, no nothing. We know, I know how hard it is. I just keep thinking back, you know, when I first started, how hard it was. And now, even with all the information, all the stuff that's happening, it's still hard. You don't know where to go and where to start. So True. having, you know, so yeah, I try to give the information I have could be out of date, but I try to learn from others as well. So um, it's always a learning process, you know. How many people yeah. attended uh, PyCon Ireland last time? Do you know, like around? So it's uh, well, it's, for- it's, it's, uh, so I can tell you that it's whatever the max the hotel can safely fit us in <laughs> because we keep pushing the numbers we went from 100 uh, they saved us the first year because we lost our evening event space on the first year things go wrong as usual it always goes wrong when you organize stuff so this hotel the Rasm Blue uh, they hosted us it was like initially it was like 100 150 to 250 to 350 we keep pushing and pushing so whatever the max I don't know 400 I have no idea whatever the max their halls fit it's like three banquet halls that they it's like a huge banquet hall that can split into mm-hmm. three for uh so it's very normal in hotels and then the, for the plenary they opened up the three halls again to make it a plenary session so whatever the safety the safe amount of people they can fit in for their health and safety that is the amount it's a few hundred so it's quite good and they're, they're cool. quite, cons- they're quite quite cons- consistent like uh, as well so it's nice to see and it's nice to be an attendee and not an organizer <laughs> <So I'm laughs> 
So um, currently, what are you actually working on? Like, uh, is there any new activities or some Python related uh, events or or PyLadies? Yeah, I still run uh, PyLadies each month. Um, there is a growing team of helpers. I'm I'm kind of trying to support them and trying to get them to get things going, like the study, the, the Python study group, or uh, and things like that. And any ideas? I'm like PyLadies Dublin. We're very open on what people want to do. Um, we're very, I can be very experimental. Uh, other things. Um, I'm involved with another initiative called Coding Grace. It's a uh, diverse. We advocate diversity in tech, mainly myself through Coding Grace. Uh, we curate newsletters. Um. And and, uh, and, and events in around the island of Ireland. But we do have a virtual series of events uh, for the next few months coming up called Caponte. A Caponte is an Irish f- word for cup of tea because, as I mentioned, we don't like, like pie ladies, we don't like beer and pizza. So we like our cups of tea. I do have a cup of my mug of tea in front of me right now, an Irish tea. Um, and th- that's, that's so this cool. particular <laughs> this particular conference is aimed at principal engineers, head of engineering, staff engineers, because we do, there's a lot of uh, uh, events, but there's not one. There wasn't one aimed at very senior level, so we wanted to create one called uh, Caponte Conf. So hopefully, mm-hmm. we get enough interest um, for the virtual ones. Um, we do have three speakers all lined up. Um, Laura Nor- Nolan talking about path dependence, history matters on March 26th. John Looney, second system event, not a new problem mm-hmm. on April 4th. Patricia As, um, who's an international speaker talking about classic vulnerabilities on May 7th. And details can be found in caponteconf.com. That's one big one. How, <laughs> how, do you spell, how do you spell cup on tea? Can I have a cup oh. on tea, please? <laughs> cup on. So C U P. So there's an A. I know in French you call it an ague. So I don't mm-hmm. know what other languages, what you call it's like a, a uh, you know, it's like uh, on top of the A, there is like a, a no, accent like, aigu. Yeah, accent aigu, yeah. So yeah. In, in Irish, that's a father uh, because it ah. this, it elongates the A, so it's capon. So it's C-U-P-A, oh. father N, capon, space, T-A-E, and that's te, capon, te. So it's a cup oh, of tea, the, very close to a cup of tea. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and um, what, so wait, what is Irish tea? Is it black tea or? Yeah, it's normal tea. We have, <laughs> I don't want to go into the whole <laughs> argument. There's two, there's lines or <laughs> Barry's. Lies is pretty much Dublin, but everywhere else is Barry's, and I'm Barry's tea person. But I don't know if you want to keep that in the podcast, but it might cause a fury in Ireland. <laughs> so I don't want to listen to Vicky anymore. She drinks Barry's tea. <laughs> um, no, so, yeah. tea should be that way. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it should be like Barry's or Lions, you know. So Lions, when people know it's Lions because it's like a pyramid-shaped tea bag and it's all these kind of things. Mm. If you go down further south mm. of Ireland, it's definitely Barry's tea. I grew up with Barry's tea. I, I think it's fine, but it's fun to pull the leg of people who are very serious about their Irish and tea. you drink your tea with milk or? Yeah, I drink my tea with milk. No sugar um, sometimes, but normally no sugar. Yeah. Oh, this is a funny conversation. Normally a conversation <laughs> I will actually talk if I was running a podcast or a cup of tea, to be honest. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I do have a cup of milk tea in front of me and, uh, and it's a mug with cats on it. Don't know if you see oh. it. For the, for the podcast that's oh, perfect yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just so happened I picked it up uh, yeah. you, have, you have quite a professional setup do you do uh, other things with it <laughs> or why do you have such a professional setup oh that was from um, uh, thanks to COVID things got upgraded more and more because my iMac only had um, I think the camera was like uh, 720p and I wasn't very happy with it I wanted more high def because I was doing a lot of podcasts um, uh, streaming uh, live streaming and stuff and I wasn't very happy and I want a higher mm-hmm. quality I want at least 1080. I said, I want at least 1080. So <laughs> my camera it got upgraded. My lights got upgraded. My microphone upgraded at least twice, I think. I have like audio switchers. I have, you know, uh, other switchers in front of me. Um, and then the lights in the back keeps getting upgraded a little bit here and there. So yeah, there's a lot of, I still got lots of things kind of I want to do uh, because it's, it's not just purely, I want to do a lot more content creation, but been talking about that for two years to everyone who's known me so far. But before that, I've been doing a lot of stuff for when I was a maker advocate for a double maker, that was in my past. Um, it was part of, it was actually a, a cool freelance gig with double maker. If you're into the making culture, uh, they run a maker festival and COVID really dented the whole maker advocacy because you're meeting makers physically, meet, meeting makers, you're physically mm-hmm. going to colleges, talking to lecturers that you're potentially helping teachers learn about STEAM and workshops and stuff. And you can't do that <laughs> when there's a whole right. lockdown. And at one stage, we can't even go outside two clicks outside our own for 
from our home. Uh, so what we ended up doing was, uh, what I ended up doing was to, doing more content creation, making, mm-hmm. doing my own stuff, learning to sew, showing that off, and then starting to interview other, uh, remotely other makers in and around Ireland. Uh, then we had to do a virtual double maker festival that was fun through Gathertown, uh, where we had like a newscaster type thing with two sci- science communicators running around like, uh, uh, like our roving reporters doing live yeah. interviews and stuff. And I was, I was also broadcasting as well as in the behind the scenes operations as well. So it was completely hectic. Um, and then after that, I went in with another friend. We did an Irish Makers podcast. We interviewed a lot of different people from blacksmiths to special effects people to, uh, cool. bladesmiths to, uh, cosplayers to people, how they felt makers that how they felt being isolated during COVID as well. That kind of all those kind of different topics. Um, mm-hmm. so it was, and we even went to uh, Dublin Comic Con and interviewed a lot of cosplayers there. So we did a lot of content work, um, and, and also Dublin Maker itself on site. So besides sitting here, uh, we were also doing stuff, um, off site in, on, on, or on site at the various locations. So that's why all the setup is just gone. It's just got built up over, over the period. Thanks to COVID, as I said, um, and ended up doing a lot of digital stuff. So, and that kind of, um, feeds into some of the, I think mostly, yeah, uh, that was the maker stuff, which I still try to promote. Uh, I think during COVID helped a lot during Pile East Dublin as well. We kept on going with our monthly meetups. So we saw that there was a lot of people watching playbacks, not necessarily attending live because I think people were having Zoom fatigue at that stage, which is very understandable. I made peace with the numbers. Mm. I was very upset uh, setting it all up and uh, had a few near meltdowns because tech went wrong. <laughs> One stage people didn't leave after 20 minutes of te- tech melting down. They were still hanging around for me to keep it going. And I had a very special guest as well. I think it was from mm. uh, Ima- Imagi Labs. I had the C- CTO on. <laughs> that was like my January very big event. And it went horribly, horribly wrong, but everyone was super nice. And that's what I love about communities like ours, especially by ladies Dublin, technical difficulties, either virtual or even just this month when we had our, our meetup, we had a, a few technical mm. difficulties and people are all okay with it because they're just super nice, you know, um, but yeah, that's tech and I'm hoping to um, rec- well, myself and my husband hoping to uh, improve our recording at different uh, at the Pi Ladies events at the very least and hopefully we will help other user groups who are running uh, uh, their technical meetups to mm. help them record their talks because I, I can see people asking them are your talks recorded are your talks recorded and they're not yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so we're not going to do it for free but we're not also not going to charge them a huge amount but we, we definitely understand that um, you know people do need some of the content and we just give them the videos you know take the videos clean it up a bit and just give it to them and let them let them it's their, nice. it's their content like so nice. it's just to again an extension of you know, community work that we're doing here and helping people. And especially now that I heard feedback that people do appreciate Mm -hmm. online events because it's more accessible because they can't come into the city to go to an event in the evening. Things are just in the real life is in the way you can't make it. It's not like they don't, they they don't want to come. They physically can't make the time to get to it, but they would be able to watch it if it's online uh, or make playback, but they do appreciate if it's, if if it's street, if it's stream online so i, right. I kind of appreciated that kind of feedback as well so um so, so we're making a conscious effort to try and make it accessible but it is a lot more work as you know here <laughs> with a lot of editing and video it, it does take a lot more time um, and yeah. stuff like that and I so think people the- if you if you need help <laughs> vicky and her husband is here for you <laughs> Uh, I think there's one more that um, was very interesting thing that I'm involved in is um, uh, I try to stay away from startups, but I, I bumped into a friend of mine, as everyone does after COVID for a coffee. And I told her there's this itch that I'm scratching from Coding Grace side that there was uh, a lot of female founders are, are coming to us for advice, just it, just privately asking for help, saying that they're not techies. What do I do? What tech do I use? Oh, I'm locked out of my AWS account. The person that was contracting us. Um, can't be found because they forgot to give us the, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, how do we do, do we do we get a CTO now? All these kind of questions. I was just telling my friend and she just so happens to be relaunching Tech Found Her. Uh, so t- t- Tech Found and then HER. And she wanted to do a boot camp. And she said she was had a similar ideas, similar people coming up to her as well. But she was more in the startup space. So she was talking to a lot of people. So between my background and, and her background as well, she used to run Tech for Good Dublin. We decided to put our heads together last year to run this boot camp. 
camp and we're doing again this year. Uh, it's aimed at female founders in, in the kind of um, pre-seed, like early stage, or you have an idea and you want to create a startup, but you, ne- you don't necessarily have a tech background, but you know you will end up using some tech in some form or another in your startup. It's a way to bring the community together, share experiences, kind of demystify tech. And you do- just to know you don't have to be a coder to run a, do a startup that uses tech as well. And we have some uh, pretty f- pretty amazing kind of uh, speakers, which will be announced in the next few weeks. And the boot camp itself is happening on Tuesday, April 16th in a, in a historical, beautiful building uh, uh, that is at the Dublin City Hall in the Dublin City Centre. And i um, looking forward to that. Um, so that's kind of uh, something a little bit different, sort of related, crosses over because, again, it, it advocates diversity in an area of startup, um, which is, I know we have a lot of problems in tech. Oh, my goodness. Startup is like <laughs> another barrel of fun there. Um, so uh, it's, it's good to be able to help where I can um, with tech founder. So I'm pretty much kind of helping the operation side of things uh, where I can. So as you can see, when I do a lot of these kind of events, I tend to be ended up admin and at ad, ad operations. So that's why it's not the most fun part of it, but it is necessary for anyone who wants to get in community. Yes, it's lovely to talk to people. It's scary to talk in front of a lot of people. If you're on stage, if you're not comfortable, but you still have to do a lot of admin work in the background, which is not the fun part, but you have to like finances, your AGMs, if you're a uh, Incorporated, incorporated kind of organization and all that kind of stuff. It is, it is not fun, but you have to do it. But I somehow I keep on, I don't know, would you say punishing myself for this? I keep no, doing it. I don't think that's kind of like punishing. <laughs> it's just like if you want something to move on, someone has to do the job, right? Yeah. Do it, so, right. yeah. Sometimes and I, it's and really yeah. hard to find someone to, to, to like last minute, if you want to find someone to manage the finance, yeah. probably it's much faster to, to get yourself to um, it's great. doing it's great. Yeah. It's great mm-hmm. experience, especially um, I noticed that like doing small, small kind of events, small organizations like the ones I do, I can co- turn around stuff very quickly. But then, um, as I said, I worked as a, the, the maker advocate for Dublin Maker, and that was actually a paid position. It was a very special one, soft one. And it was part of um, the, the it was funded by uh, Science Foundation Ireland. So the money has to go to an institution, which is a university. So Dublin City University was where one of the volunteer organizers or the founders were and um, that's where the money was uh, going through and that's where the funding was going to and so I was kind of a staff of the university so it was a public institution dealing with finance was a completely new scale from mini organization that I look after to uh, a university which has two different finance departments and you try not to annoy any of them trying to be friends <laughs> as you sort of out through your budgets and stuff because you have to write reports for the funder who funds you and you have to make sure everything and their system is so slow and everything and codes everywhere and all these words you never heard of before and the, the but the, again I was very lucky the the, the staff there is very nice the the you know the, the department secretary was so patient i was there nearly every day for like the first three weeks trying to f- ask mm. so many questions so it's a <laughs> great experience uh i know it's not what everyone thinks of when they say they want to start up like uh, a community group or running a conference and things like that but they are it's great experience uh, um especially when it comes to organ Organ- organization in general, operations, and as you say, finances helps a lot. At least you have an inkling of what a budget is, how expenses yeah. work, give everything, you know, keep things on track, um, the, you know, things like that. They're trying to figure mm-hmm. out how to, how to herd cats as with all volunteers <laughs> trying in conferences and stuff. So it, it's good experience and, 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 it, and it will help you if you in your career as well in, in you know in your day-to-day stuff as well so it's not purely just for just yeah. for people bearing in mind if they want to come come help i'm not trying to scare you away but it is <laughs> very good uh skill uh skills really good life skills and very good uh skills in general to have um because uh y- you won't be because it's, it's just not it's not something that you can just pick you know it's not something that you can just pick up just like that and just do it yeah because you, you have to work with a lot of people True. as well and of course mm-hmm. when it when it comes when you have to handle finances it's quite important that you do it right and yeah, trans- yeah. transparency somehow, is as well somehow i feel like um starting all those community events is a little bit like uh, you being the founder of a, of a co- 
company, you know, because you have to start everything and ha- handle everything at the beginning. Mm, mm, branding, PR, yeah. <laughs> PR, marketing, <laughs> social media. Yeah. Um, like you said before, like sponsorship and uh getting where the money comes in, where the money goes out and whether you can continue next year. And uh, it's a little bit like, like I'm starting a company. Yeah. Finding yeah. venues, finding venues mm-hmm. is hard here in Dublin right now. I think it's, as, as again, COVID keeps popping up in my thing every time because it has dented a lot of different things between community groups to uh, availability of different venues to uh, nowadays because of, uh, I suppose, the world, global things happening, produce goes up in price as well. All these kind of things. So, so for me, um, I want to tell people when you run a meetup, you don't have to have food if you don't need to. <laughs> I think you, 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 because uh, I have have done uh, Pie Ladies Dublin where I ask people to bring their own beverages and their own kind of sandwiches. I think someone mentioned brown bag, right? Didn't you, Teresa? Yeah. Or, uh, and also, awful. I wanted to mention that I heard you also drink coffee. Which mm, is yeah. besides tea. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry. That yeah. was so I think that's so you're not going to upset anybody in this podcast. No, 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 no. I, I I do drink a bit of coffee, but not not too much. Um I, I think I think for, for anyone organizing kind of um small meetup groups, it'd be great. You know, I think lucky if you can get a company to host you because normally yeah. they have a kitchenette so people can make their own tea coffee and grab some water. And depending on the type of companies, they'll have snacks and stuff like that anyway. So people snack and stuff. But you don't need your beer. You don't need your pizza. You don't need all those and sandwiches smaller and venues, stuff. Smaller and, venues won't offer that. Yeah. Even. And you'd be wasting food and things like that. You don't know where to go. I have in, in the early days where I have to bring platters of sandwiches back home and you're there looking at the fridge for three days with the sad sandwiches in the fridge and taking out all the salads oh, no. so you can make your own <laughs> salads from it so you don't waste the salad. Oh, no. <laughs> and then eventually you have to toss out some of the sandwiches anyway because after three something days, then, you know, you don't want to get <laughs> food poisoning. It's just um, it, you can't, and also you can't just hand you know sandwiches to to kind of homeless shelters because some of them would have been open. There's a very strict guidelines on what they accept mm-hmm. and don't accept. So uh, so and it's a cost a lot of money uh, catering. I'm just trying to tell people, but we are so spoiled that people expect beer, pizza, and sandwiches or whatever it is, food all the time. So uh, so yeah, I, I I run things very frugally for my own events. So I'm I'm mm-hmm. just uh, just just uh, mainly coding grace uh, pie ladies specific. Specifically, that's definitely zero budget. And then uh, side, and the side, other things I do is get, uh, game jams. Again, I run that very frugally. Um, if I'm helping other people, I try to point out things, you know, but it's it's their budget at the end of the day. So I can I help them where I can and point out things. But for my own events that I run, um, I try to make sure, you know, that uh, we, we, we don't waste any money. The money should be spent on the people, not <laughs> not, not, not on, on, on other frivolous stuff, I suppose, from my, my point of view. So yeah, I I have a question regarding what's next. Do you have oh. small plans, big plans, Python plans? Mm-hmm. I suppose uh, with the um, the when I mentioned Caponte. Uh, virtual talks I did say that uh, that that's used to gauge the interest from people um, if they like the format so the format is person gives uh, the guest speaker gives the talk about an hour it's quite a long talk uh, it's very in-depth technical talk and then followed by an unconference style breakout sessions afterwards so it's like the DDD conference uh, you can do a search for that it's sort of like that the DDD unconference kind of format but we were going to do it in person but uh, it didn't work out uh, timing wise so we decided to do virtual to gauge interest and we have enough interest we would like to host this conference outside of Dublin because Dublin is expensive we want to raise the profile of the tech technical user group community in that local town or city and also because um, people have been working remotely from home, uh, some of those people might be don't have to travel to Dublin. They can actually go to the lo- this this particular conference. This is in their locale uh, as well. So, uh, and if this works out, we would like to move to different towns and cities around Ireland to highlight the tech community and stuff like that. I hope you can see a passion here in what we're trying to do. Uh, besides the, it's like, the it's theme, like events on the wheel, you know? <laughs> events on wheels. <laughs> Just <laughs> but we're aiming at, at more senior people as well because um, uh, we want to be. We, we try to focus this one as well and also trying to make it sustainable because um, we're doing these a lot of these events and it has a set would be very frugal but it doesn't mean that it's 
maintainable and sustainable. We don't actually, you know, charge memberships or anything like that. So that's one thing. We're just trying to try this out. It's experimental. Uh, myself, uh, my husband is also on, on the team, founding team, and my friend who's based in London, who will be in New Zealand uh, very soon. So that's going to be fun to organize stuff together. That's a different challenge, remote organizing for someone on the other side of the world. But then that, that's one thing. And the other thing is just keep recording talks at Pi Ladies Dublin and try and um, perfect that pr process. So myself and my husband can offer our help to other local tech community groups to record their talks. And hopefully I get to run another game jam, I suppose, by the end of the year. We did one recently in Cork. I would love to do, um, in relation to that, that's part of GameCraft. We did a, last year, we did a DIY custom game controller where um, we actually custom designed Ooh. a PCB board and uh, uh, and p we, we preloaded it with a Python on it or a MicroPython on it. Uh, and um, all the people had to do was learn how to connect the wires uh, between cool. the, the, the PCB board uh, and the Raspberry Pi Pico. And then they can just, we just gave them lots of crafty stuff and they can just make their own board, board, uh, board uh, their game controllers or whatever they want to do with the controllers it can be out completely uh, uh, completely different use whatever they want um, but we gave them the components so we, we did some we did this for beta festival late last year and we have some components left over so we want to run something again uh, similar um, it's not a it was meant to be a jam but it ended up becoming a workshop because we didn't want to scare people away because the electronics they, they think that there's programming involved but there's none because we preloaded it so you should just plug it in and should be able to play any game you want oh. and things like that so yeah there's a lot as I said we have um, if I've, I do a lot of different things but the main core things is see if I can get to a conference from Cup on via the Cup on Te, uh, kind of virtual talks and right. make that into an in-person one because we want to actually have afternoon tea because for lunch <laughs> there's a whole theme Definitely. going on there we have a whole theme going on there and um, it's going to be ha held in uh, kind of um, down in the southeast and it's going to be in a in a grand house um, with lovely gardens and stuff you know that's the plan we're going to see how things go so those are the two kind of things uh, three, two or three different things I'm sure there's lots of other stuff that I, I know but they're, they're they're all kind of being juggled and ongoing at the same time right <laughs> do you have any hidden hobbies that you... <laughs> <laughs> Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> uh, let me see. I've I have heard so just many now things secretly you said something about sewing. Yeah, I have so many things. I have to get back onto my sewing machine. Um, I have so many passions. I want to make my first pair of uh, of pants. I've got um I've got cross stitching. I want to get back on as well. What else have we got? Oh, oh, I want to do, I want to finish off my kind of what, what do I have back here? Hold on. I have something here. My lino print. Uh, sorry. Bit of a noise here. But I've been doing a bit of lino printing. Ooh, can I see? Can you see this? Oh, thing? wow. Oh, that's cool. That's so that's a pair of lino board. So it's just right beside me. So uh, that, that's, so that's me carving. Trying, carving into lino and trying not to cut myself. Um, also uh, digital painting. What else? Oh yeah, cross media, trans, kind of, kind of cross media, kind of um, uh, art stuff that I want to do. Oh, I'm making zines. Oh my god, I want to make zines. I want to make so many <laughs> zines. What else do I have? I'm looking around me. I was like, so <laughs> I'm sorry, in my room. This is also my maker room. So there's lots of things nice. hanging around that is on my to-do list, which I have started and not com finished and completed. Of course, the other thing, big thing, is just renovating this room, uh, making a proper maker room. But yeah, there's a, the, I have a lot of things that I want to do. It's just uh, the time really and finishing it and I just um, yeah I just need to take a step back and just want to do stuff but then when I stand back and want to do stuff I end up playing like games like cozy games or something because that's just relaxing and then I realize oh, oh. <laughs> so yeah it's like, <laughs> so yeah I get distracted so easily <laughs> so yeah if you ask me what I, I think I just too many to name um, mm -hmm. but I just need to sit down I have also a lot of electronic projects that I want to do that I have finished as well and also so many different videos that I want to make like my you know uh, digital videos of my journeys of you know car journeys and things like that and oh it's just nice. so much that I want to do I just need to pick maybe the top three and just do it or something <laughs> or when you know when the inspiration strikes I'm currently knitting 
So I'm knitting yoga socks with writing on them. And, but wow. since December, I have a tufting gun. So my plan is to make some carpets in the flat. So, oh my goodness, you're on a completely different level. <laughs> and she's really good in knitting. Like socks is hers. <laughs> no, you should look at her knitting stuff. It's crazy. She does like a, so I saw the recent one that she did. She did oh, was a like a sweater stuff. zigzag wave. But I follow the pattern. Oh. I mean, I don't. Yeah, but still. Yeah. So, so we can, can we see your your project on Instagram, or where can we see your? I have, like I don't put up stuff if they're not really finished. I try to put up stuff when they're what? finished. You should which always. That means there's not home. much. <laughs> <laughs> like I can tell you, uh, I did enjoy crocheting on, uh, and uh, at the time, not many many years ago, I asked my D and D GM if I can crochet a D twenty, and he says yes as long as it's loaded right and um, so i started crocheting at the 20 i'm quite new in the crocheting then i realized all the triangles were wrong and i had like i would have them all sewing up and i realized things were going wrong and didn't look right i had to undo all the stitching I had to undo and then i started yeah, unraveling the stuff and then i gave up i was so sad i gave up and i said i don't do i don't want to do it again i don't want to look crochet again yeah you picked like a very complicated project but i was very confident i i did too many i did so many squares i said how hard could it be to do triangles <laughs> I, that's the same when i wanted to do 3d printing but the one with the pen yeah you know you can like you yeah, can get the that's pen hard. and my yeah. starter project was pickle rick oh that's hard <laughs> wow <laughs> because there was a youtube video about it like some guy like doing pickle rick yeah. and i was it's following like, you that. you can do it i can do it <laughs> i i think i spent like four hours i made the head of pickle rick it was kind of flat but looked cool yeah. and then i gave it as a present to someone that was super excited about pickle yeah. rick and then i never did 3d <laughs> <laughs> oh, those 3D pens are hard to use, though. Those 3D pens. So yeah. <laughs> so how how do people get to um get get in touch with you if they want to um you know maybe ask Vicky and to to help with some recordings or, or get some advice um, from you on LinkedIn? You find me right. on LinkedIn if you want to email me. I suppose with regards to Pileys Dublin uh, Dublin at Pileys mm -hmm. but LinkedIn. Right. Um, thank you so much, Vicky, for joining us today at um, PyPod Cats. You can find us in um, PyPodCats.live or you can also um, search on YouTube channel from the PSF to watch these episodes. And you can also catch us in any of your favorite uh, podcast channel, Apple, Spotify, whatever you prefer. Mm -hmm.